Number 1. Mary was last seen in Lighthouse Point, Florida on April 28, 1982. She lived in the 3100 block of Northeast 31st Avenue. The previous day, she visited her daughter and her daughter's family, then went out with friends for her regular evening out. She seemed to be in a good mood at the time. At 1.45 a.m., she left for home. According to her estranged husband, Joseph A. Dusich, he and Mary got into an argument in the living room which turned into a fight, and Joseph punched her in the face, bloodying her nose. She left the house angrily, got into her yellow four-door 1978 Lincoln Continental, and drove away. She has never been heard from again. Mary's Lincoln was found in May 1982, in the long-term parking lot at Miami International Airport. Her purse was in the trunk, along with some old clothing. Inside the purse were Mary's checkbook and photos of her daughter and grandchildren, but no cash or wallet. Police could find no bloodstains or other indications of a fight at the couple's home, and no blood traces in her vehicle. After 16 years of marriage, the Dusiches were going through a bitter divorce at the time of Mary's disappearance. Neither wanted to relinquish the rights to their home, so they continued to live together, but in different wings. They had cowbells on their bedroom doors, and police described the atmosphere as like an armed camp. Mary had accused Joseph of beating her, and twice police went to their home to settle domestic disputes. In 1980, after being assaulted by her husband, she had had to go to the hospital to get her injuries treated. Mary got a restraining order against him, but no charges were ever filed. Joseph, meanwhile, called Mary very abusive in his testimony about the divorce. It's unclear whether Mary's disappearance had anything to do with the divorce. Her husband died in 1996. Although he said he thought Mary might have left on her own, but Mary's family and friends believed she'd met with foul play. Her case remains unsolved. Number 2. Melissa Linek, age 15, disappeared from Pensacola, Florida on June 25, 1992. Melissa left the home of her boyfriend, Brian Kittle, on Blakely Drive at about 8 p.m. after an argument. She was believed to be headed to a friend, Lisa's house. Brian went after her, walking with her part of the way before turning back, leaving Melissa to walk the rest of the way alone. Her destination was at Patricia Drive and Clara Street, about a mile walk in total, according to media accounts. It's been suggested that the above information, which has been published on various missing persons sites and in news articles, is at least partially incorrect. Map searches show that the two locations are actually nearly five miles apart, close to a two-hour walk. Someone with personal knowledge of the case believes that the home she departed from was in Brian's home, but that of a mutual friend, and that Brian lived much closer to Lisa's home. Strangely, Melissa's purse was left behind. In light of the confusion explained above, I'm not clear on exactly where the purse was left. It wasn't like Melissa to leave without her purse. This has led both her family and authorities to suspect foul play, and Brian has been named a person of interest. Law enforcement reclassified her disappearance as a homicide after statements from Brian and other witnesses were suspicious. It's worth noting that there are other questions as to the facts that have been reported on the case. An article published a few weeks after her disappearance states that Lisa had spoken with Melissa on the phone just before she left Brian's home and that she told her that Brian was going to walk with her. This, of course, differs from recent reports of him running after her following an argument. Melissa worked at the original Point restaurant on Interarity Road in Pensacola at the time of Het de Sapientans. Her last two paychecks went unclaimed. Number 3. Neil Allen went on an ocean fishing trip with his father, Neil Wayne Edelman, and Neil Wayne's friend Gary Lisk, 61, on October 17, 2003 in Naples, Florida. Photographs of Lisk and of a boat similar to the one they had are posted with this case summary. The boat, which belonged to Lisk and was named What's Left, was a white 24-foot Hydra sports vessel with a white hard top and a single 200 HP of in-route outboard engine, it was made in 1997. Lisk and the Edelmans were reportedly bound for the California, a shipwreck 60 miles southwest of Marco Island, which is a popular spot for diving and catching grouper fish. They took all reasonable safety precautions when they left, such as bringing along safety equipment. Weather conditions in the area were calm. At 7 p.m., two hours after the boat left shore, Neil Allen attempted to call his girlfriend on his cellular phone from a point 17 miles outside Gordon Pass. This is the last contact ever made with any of them. The three boaters were supposed to return at 6 p.m. on October 18, but did not. Neil Wayne's wife called police when they had not returned by 11 p.m., and the United States Coast Guard then launched a search for them. 
there was a report that they landed in Cuba and were taken prisoner by the Cubans, but this turned out to be false. On October 24, having looked over 129,000 square miles of the Gulf of Mexico with no result, the Coast Guard suspended the search for them. On November 3, wreckage of the boat was found upside down on the shore of Cape Canaveral, Florida, near a National Aeronautics and Space Administration NASA, launch pad on military land. This spot is 527 miles from the last contact and on the Atlantic side of Florida. Photographs of the wrecked boat are posted with this case summary. Sea life evidence on the boat indicated that it had capsized and floated upside down for at least two weeks, possibly in the Gulf Stream, before coming ashore. Lisk's body was found in the wreckage and identified on November 6. While an autopsy could not determine the exact cause of his death due to decomposition, police say there was no evidence of foul play. He was a diabetic and had only two days' worth of insulin on him when he left Naples. Lisk's family members, however, are suspicious of his death and the Edelman's disappearances. Before departing for his fishing trip, Lisk left a note on his home's door, saying he would be gone for a few days, his family says this is uncharacteristic of him, as the note would invite burglars. His daughter said the note did not appear to be in Lisk's handwriting. Someone changed the locks on Lisk's home in his absence. He was a drug counselor and psychotherapist, and police say his patients changed the locks to keep their confidentiality secure, but Lisk's family disputes this. Neil Allen and Neil Wayne's remains were not found with Lisks or anywhere else, there was no indication whatsoever of their whereabouts. They have never been heard from again. The two of them were declared legally dead in July 2005, Neil Allen's mother sought for a presumptive death certificate for her son, so she could file lawsuits against Neil Wayne and Lisks' estates. She alleges that the men were negligent when driving the boat and that this resulted in her son's wrongful death. Neil Allen was an eighth grader at Golden Gate Middle School at the time of his disappearance. He and his father were both members of the Naples Seventh-day Adventist Church. He is a good swimmer. Neil Allen and his father remain missing, and their cases are unsolved. Number 4 Iva was last seen leaving her job at the Ranch House restaurant on West 49th Street in Hialeah, Florida at 1.30 a.m. on October 26, 1974. A co-worker said she left with her estranged husband, James T. Bone Edwards, and they walked across the street towards Big Daddy's Lounge. She has never been heard from again. Iva and her husband married in 1949 and had twin boys and three daughters. Prior to the marriage, James was dishonorably discharged from the army after serving only five months and was arrested a dozen times, mostly for minor crimes. He did serve 14 months in prison for grand larceny. According to her daughters, James had a violent temper, tortured and killed their pets, and also sexually abused them. They told Iva about it on several occasions, but she didn't intervene. All of the couple's children had serious problems as adults. Their youngest daughter ran away from home at age 12 and developed a drug addiction, and she and one her sisters lost custody of their children. One of her their sons was imprisoned for a series of bank robberies, and the other son committed suicide while in his 20s. Iva finally left James in 1974. She and her 18-year-old daughter, Rena, moved in with their oldest daughter and her infant son in an apartment in the 600 block of West 68th Street in Hialeah. She began seeing another man took a late-shift job at the ranch house on West 49th Street. On the evening of October 25, two days before their 25th wedding anniversary, James came to the ranch house and waited several hours in his truck in the parking lot until Iva got off of work. Rena saw him sitting in the parking lot during Iva's shift and told her mother she was sure he was going to kill both of them. Iva reassured her, telling her to go home and daddy's never going to hurt you again. Rena went home and made a pot of coffee and waited for Iva's return. Sometime that evening, Iva called her and said she'd come home after work and they'd have dinner. She sounded calm and normal during the conversation. She never returned to her the apartment, however. When questioned, James said he'd had a drink with Iva at Big Daddy's and then dropped her off at the apartment at 2.45 a.m. He stated he noticed four or five hippie-type Puerto Rican men in the parking lot, sitting on the hood of Iva's car, and she told them to stop. After seeing her walk towards her apartment door, James left and drove home to Fort Myers, Florida, arriving at 5.45. Iva's children don't believe she left of her own accord because she left all her clothes behind. After her daughters told the police about James' history, investigators began treating the case as a possible homicide. Although James failed a polygraph test, authorities couldn't find any evidence against him. The case was reopened in 1989. The police questioned James, who denied having harmed his wife. 
James' brother, however, stated James had bragged about killing Iva about a year after her disappearance, and James' young daughter and her husband both said he'd threatened to kill them as he had Iva. Investigators still couldn't find sufficient evidence to charge James in Iva's disappearance, however. Foul play is suspected in Iva's disappearance. Her case remains unsolved. Number 5 Egan was last seen in Plantation, Florida on July 21, 1975. He disappeared in the early morning hours after working a shift at the Florida Processing Company in the 6900 block of Northwest 69th Street. His best friend and co-worker, Norman Paul Rubottom, who was addressed by his middle name, stated they left together, and Egan did arrive at his home in the 5800 block of Cypress Road, and that his Jeep was found in the garage with his wallet inside it, and the ignition keys were on his dresser in the bedroom. Police have been unable to prove this. Rubottom found the Jeep and the keys himself and drove the vehicle around for several hours before going to the police station to report Egan missing. Egan's brother, who lived with him, didn't wake up during the night or hear anything unusual. Police looked into the possibility that he fell or was pushed into one of the rendering machines at the processing company, which grind up horses for use in soap, fertilizer and cat food. They inspected the machinery and found no evidence of human tissue there. However, they noted that due to the nature of the machines, any evidence of foul play might have been obliterated. Egan had a passport, and authorities looked into the possibility that he traveled to Haiti, Jamaica or South America. They have ruled out suicide in his case and don't believe drugs were involved either. It's uncharacteristic of Egan to leave without warning, and he wasn't having any problems at home at the time of his disappearance. Rubottom died at home in August 1977, at the age of 25, in a bizarre accident while inhaling an anesthetic gas called cyclopropane. Egan's case remains unsolved and foul play is suspected. Number 6 Tarek and his nine-year-old sister, Sarah, disappeared from Miami, Florida on May 9, 2003 when their non-custodial father, Ahmed Abdulul Safi, picked them up for a scheduled visitation. He was supposed to return the children to their mother on May 11, but never did. The children's mother, Meryl Safi, who is Ahmed's ex-wife, reported their abductions to police on May 14 and was subsequently granted sole custody of Sarah and Tarek. A felony warrant for kidnapping was issued for Ahmed on April 12, 2004. Photos of Ahmed are posted with this case summary. His date of birth is September 22, 1961, making him 42 years old at the time of the children's abduction. He's described as African-American, 5'11 and 205 to 220 pounds, with black hair and black eyes. Ahmed may use the alias dates of birth September 23, 1961, September 24, 1961 or October 18, 1969. He may use the alias names Ahmed Abdallah, Muhammad Abdullah, Ahmed Muhammad, Ahmed Hamoud, Hamoud Ashamimri and or Muhammad al-Safi. He was born in Sudan. He has work experience as a mechanic for an American airline and could also work as a pilot. Sarah was found safe in September 2018. By this time, she was 24 years old. Her brother remains missing, however. Tarek and Ahmed may have traveled to Canada, Sudan, Yemen, or Saudi Arabia, 